Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about what's called the Warren Buffett portfolio. You all know Warren Buffett. He is the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, considered probably the best investor of all time. And uh, he gives a lot of great wisdom and perspective when it comes to investing. And he does it in a number of ways, but perhaps the, the most important is through his letters each year to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. Full disclosure, I, am a, I own Berkshire Hathaway stock. I've been to the Berkshire Hathaway uh, meeting uh, in Omaha, I think twice now, uh, and am a, a big uh, Warren Buffett fan. But he said something very interesting in the 2013 Berkshire Hathaway shareholder letter, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And what he did was he laid out what he thought was a great portfolio for average investors uh, like you and me. In fact, he even said that the portfolio, and I'm going to walk through uh, what it looks like, exactly what he said, but he said it would it would outperform over the long term, even those portfolios used by pension funds and institution institutional investors that pay a fortune to advisors. And the portfolio is so simple. In a past video, I talked about the three fund portfolio, which is pretty simple. Well, the Warren Buffett portfolio is only two funds. So it's, I guess, the two fund portfolio. So let's get right to it. Let me first show you uh, what it looks like. So this is his 2013 letter. And I'll leave a link to this below uh, the video. And what I want to do before we actually get to uh, the actual portfolio is kind of put this in context. In this letter, and we're looking at page 19, he starts talking about how he and Charlie Munger, uh, the vice, uh, I guess vice chairman, I think, is his title if I've got it right, but Warren Buffett's business partner, how they go about thinking through their investments. And, and they, they do that and, and give insight into that every year. And uh, they talk about that. But what's interesting in this particular letter is he talked to folks like you and me, folks that maybe don't have uh, the background in finance that a Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger does, or just don't want to spend the time that it takes. And I want to focus on this paragraph right here where he says, I have good news for the, these non-professionals, i.e. you and me. The typical investor doesn't need this skill, and he's referring to the skill that he has and that Charlie Munger have. In aggregate, American business has done wonderfully over time and will continue to do so, though most assuredly in unpredictable fits and starts. In the 20th century, the Dow Jones Industrial Index advanced from 66 to 11,497, paying a rising stream of dividends to boot. The 21st century will witness further gains, almost certain to be substantial. The goal of the non-professional should not be to pick winners. Neither he nor his helpers, and by that he means financial advisors, can do that, but should rather be to own a cross-section of business that in aggregate are bound to do well. A low-cost S&P 500 uh, index fund will achieve this goal. Now, that starts to give you some perspective on where this Warren Buffett portfolio uh, is headed. It's a two-fund portfolio, and yes, one of the funds, no surprise, an S&P 500 index fund. Before we get to the rest of it, though, let's go back to his letter because there's still uh, some important things, some important nuggets to get out of this. And it's in the next paragraph. He says, that's the what of investing for the non-professional. The when is also important. The main danger is that the timid or beginning investor will enter the market at a time of extreme exuberance and then become disillusioned when paper losses occur. Remember the late Barton Biggs observation. A bull market is like sex. It feels best just before it ends. Let me stop there. Got to be the, one of the best quotes of all times because it really does, I think, encapsulate, perhaps in a mm, silly way, uh, what it might feel like right now, right? Because equities are expensive on his, based on at least historic standards. If you look at a PE, price to earnings or price to book, stocks ain't cheap. And one wonders, you know, is it going to be coming to an end soon? Of course, no one knows. And those who think they know, you don't. Uh, but here's what Warren Buffett says about that. Let's go back to his letter right here. He says the antidote to that kind of mistiming is for an investor to accumulate shares over a long period 
and never sell when the news is bad and stocks are well off their highs. Following those rules, the know-nothing investor who both diversifies and keeps his costs minimal is virtually certain to get satisfactory results. Indeed, the unsophisticated investor who is realistic about his shortcomings is likely to obtain better long-term results than the knowledgeable professional who is blind to even a single weakness. Honestly, you, we could probably throw out all of the books on investing, just put in those couple of paragraphs, and frankly, that's about all you really need. So what does the Warren Buffett portfolio look like? Well, you already know one of them. It's the S&P 500 Index Fund. He recommends putting 90% in an S&P 500 Index Fund. He specifically identifies Vanguard, but I'm guessing he would be quick to say any low-cost S&P 500 Index Fund would do. And the other uh, 10%, he puts it in just uh, a, a low cost index fund that invests in US uh, short term government bonds. That's it. Pretty simple. Now, let's go back to his letter one more time. This is where he talks about it right here. And he says, look, I'm not just talking here. This is actually how I've advised the, the, the trustees who will take care of money that he is going to leave uh, to his wife. That's how he wants them to invest it. It's kind of interesting. You know, he doesn't say to the trustees, take the money I'm going to leave my wife and put it in Berkshire Hathaway stock, or, or for that matter, Tesla or Amazon or ARK ETFs. He says, no, 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 no. 90% in an S&P 500 index, 10% in, in of the cash in short-term government bonds. And I love this line right here. He says, I believe the trust's long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors, whether pension funds, institutions, or individuals who employ high fee managers. Now, that last part is important. He didn't say that, that this portfolio will do better than anybody, that uh, better than all individuals, better than all pensions, better than all institutions. What he said was, it will do better than those who employ uh, high fee managers. So that would just about include every hedge fund, right? Uh, their two and 20 uh, model. Uh, it, it'll include pensions who, who use hedge funds and other expensive advisors uh, to manage their portfolios. And it'll include you and me if we go to a, you know investment advisor who wants to charge us 1% of assets under management or goodness, even more. And on top of that, put us in expensive mutual funds. So that's the Warren Buffett portfolio. Now, I'm not going to stop there. I want to look at a couple of other things in this video. The first is, well, goodness, how well has this portfolio done? If we can look back in the past, you know, what can we expect from this? So we can do that. I'm going to walk through how. And I'm going to walk through the how and the tool that I use. It's called Portfolio Visualizer. But I'm going to do that so you can do this for yourself, not just for this portfolio, but any portfolio, right? So let's take a look at that on the screen. Here's Portfolio Visualizer. It's literally just PortfolioVisualizer.com. This is the home page. It's a free tool. And you come over here to Backtest Asset Allocation right here. And um, this can look a little intimidating at first, but it's fairly straightforward. And um, it starts out, that their data at best goes back to 1972, but that's still great, right? That's almost 50 years of data. And uh, you can start with whatever initial investment you want. I'm going to keep it at $10,000. Now, the other thing you can do is add cash flows. So in other words, are you just investing a lump sum at the beginning of this period and nothing else? Or are you going to contribute money over time? I always like to include contributing money over time. And this is important. The reason I do is because that's how we invest, right? At least it's, it's how I invest. I don't, I don't think most of us graduate from high school or college, stick whatever, 50 grand in, in, in an investment and then never add another dollar to it, right? That's just not how people invest. So uh, I don't know the, the, the amount of the contributions is all that important. I try to keep it somewhat realistic. So I'll just say $500, we'll adjust it for inflation, sure, and we'll contribute that monthly. Again, the $500 isn't that all that important. Uh, it, it's just a matter of trying to get something that's you know reasonable. We're going to re rebalance annually, but you have other options here. We'll do it annually. Uh, we could you know have a benchmark, but I think given the portfolio we're going to put in here, we don't really need one because it's basically an S&P 500 index. So how do we create the portfolio? Well, we can select asset classes here. So a um, S&P, I don't think they actually have what they call an S&P, no, but it would be U.S. large cap, right? 
and that's going to be 90 percent and uh and then for fixed income we want u.s government short term so fixed income here we go short-term treasury all right treasury by the way for those new to investing is what they call basically u.s government bonds treasury bonds right or, or bills bills would be short term technically and bonds would be longer term but in any event uh 10 there we are now we could compare this to some other portfolios and and that's certainly uh, a, a good thing to do. But I think in our case, we just want to see how this portfolio does for the moment. So then we just analyze the portfolio. And well, all we've done, this the screen we're at is still here. We're still on the same page. It just drops us down to the results. Now, the one thing I want to notice note is that, you know, we put in here 1972. But when we look at the results, it's actually starting in 77. This explains why right here. Uh, because of one of the uh, asset classes we picked, and I'm going to guess it's the, the, the short-term treasury, I think. But in any event, uh, the site just doesn't have data going back to 72. So it, they give us as much range as they have data for, and it just happens to be January 1977. Still, obviously, you know, over 40 years, 40, what, four years of data. So not bad, huh? All right. So this gives us sort of the data. We can see our 10000 plus $500 a month. Uh, investment adjusted for inflation grew to just a small little balance here of ten million two hundred thousand dollars. Thank you, compounding. Um, if boy, if that doesn't get you to want to start investing today, I, I, honestly, I don't know what else would. Compound annual growth rate may surprise you. If you think about the S and P five hundred, you think, well, wait a minute, Rob, hasn't it like returned ten percent or eleven percent depending on your time period? What's this seventeen percent? It, it's because we're contributing on a monthly basis, right? And that effect, that will affect the compound annual growth rate. Um, and I think, that, like I said, this is, I think, more realistic. If we took this out, if we said, let's not contribute, right? We're just gonna lump sum, 10 grand, how do we do? It will bring down the compound annual growth rate uh, substantially, right? Because it's just a lump sum at the beginning of this long time period. When you contribute monthly, every little investment little, I mean, $500 isn't little, but relatively speaking, is going to affect the returns based on what the market was doing that month, because you're going to be investing in good times, but you're also going to be investing in the middle of the 1987 crash, the dot-com bubble burst, the financial crisis in 08, you know, um, and so on. So it does affect the compound annual growth rate uh, pretty significantly. And, uh, and I'll go back real quick and we'll uh, we'll go ahead and Contribute, there we go. Bring us back to our original portfolio just for comparison purposes. It gives you some other, I think, useful data. The best year, the worst year, the max drawdown, right? And they actually tell you if you hover over the little, little icon there, drawdown period based on monthly returns is November 07 to February 09. Now remember, in this hypothetical, we're still dutifully investing our $500 every month and we're rebalancing every year and we're not taking our money out of the market. That's important. We go back to Buffett's letter. He talks about that, the win, right? And he says it, the antidote to the kind of mistiming is for an investor to basically invest and stick with it. Never to sell when news is bad and stocks are well off their highs. Right. Stocks were bad right here and they were well off their highs. And I have good friends who sold, and they tell me today with profound regret that it was one of the biggest investing mistakes they'd ever made. So Warren Buffett's portfolio works. Uh, it, 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 it is, uh, I, I won't say that it's necessarily the best portfolio for everyone. You know, I've talked in the past about the three fund portfolio, the four fund portfolio, and so on. I think all of these are good, reasonable ways to invest. I think Warren Buffett would agree if, I can pretend to speak for him because remember, I don't think his point was so much, boy, you've got to have this specific portfolio and all others are bad. He was comparing that low cost index fund portfolio to using high cost advisors, high cost uh, uh, investment advisors, high cost mutual funds, ridiculous high cost hedge funds. You may watch the show Billions and it may be entertaining, but it's not the way you should invest. That was Warren Buffett's point. Now, uh, I want to go and talk about one, uh, well, two other things really about the Warren Buffett portfolio and give you some things to think about and uh, some resources to check out. Because one question would be, well, you know, what if I'm getting near retirement? 
does that portfolio make sense? 90% stocks, 10% bonds seems awfully rich. That may be fine for Warren Buffett's wife, who's probably going to inherit, I would think, billions, but if not hundreds of millions. You know, we're probably not dealing with quite as much money. Well, it's interesting. Some folks have already started to answer that question. Is the 90-10 portfolio a good retirement portfolio? Now, I will tell you for me personally, I would not follow it. It's just a little too rich for me. I'm currently, I guess, uh, I'm not technically retired, but I'm moving in that direction. I'm at an 80-20. I kind of think I'll end up somewhere around 70-30 when I'm truly completely retired. However, I like to keep an open mind. So uh, there's some research I want to show you by a professor. In Sp he's from Spain uh, and does a lot of research on um, uh, investing drawdowns and retirement portfolios and retirement. Okay, enough chit chat. Let me show you the article. Here it is. And I will, uh, again, leave an, a link to this uh, in the, in the uh, below the video. Uh, Javier Estrada is the professor. You can see him here. And uh, he basically examined the, the, the Buffett's asset allocation. And he examined it from the perspective of a retiree, which I thought was kind of interesting to do. And uh, you can, of course, read the article for yourself if you want to. But basically, he said, you know, yeah, actually, this, this works out pretty good. Uh, it has pretty good results. And uh, I won't dive into great detail on the article. It's only six pages long. And this was, this was uh, you know, it's a, it's a very easy read. But what I want to show you is, is a couple of things. I'm going to scroll down to this first chart, which is here, this Exhibit 1. Um, what he did was he looked at different asset allocations using... Warren Buffett's two funds, the S&P 500 and the, uh, the short-term government bonds. And he looked at portfolios ranging from, as you can see here, 100% uh, um, stocks all the way down to 30% stocks, 70% bonds. He looked at, I think it's 86 different retirement scenarios annually, rolling periods beginning in 1900. Yeah, here it is, 86. And uh, so what he found was... This is the failure rate. So of, of those 86 retirement scenarios, 3.5% failed, meaning you ran out of money before 30 years in this portfolio. The only one that had no failure rate, interestingly, is the 60-40 portfolio. But all of these did reasonably well, except when you got really low on equities, and then the failure rate jumps. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the mean, the mean and median. And what this shows is how much was left over at the end of the 30 years. In his analysis, he just assumed a $1,000 portfolio uh, and used the 4% rule. So he's taking out 4,000, or excuse me, $40 in year one and then adjusting for inflation. And you know what's interesting, and I think this is something for folks to consider that are in or near retirement, um, the 60-40 portfolio may have had a zero failure rate, but what it left you with was significantly less than these richer portfolios. So. When you're in retirement, certainly the failure rate is critical. You, can, you, you really want to focus on that for sure. But you know, a lot of folks are also wanting to leave money to their loved ones. And that's an important objective during retirement as well. And if, if that's you and you're considering it, uh, you know, this data can be, I think, really useful. And uh, I want to show you one more before we, we move on. He did, uh, I'll show you the chart first. It's right here. We're going to come back to it. But he suggested two sort of twists. That's what he calls them. T1 and T2, to the Warren Buffett portfolio as applied to retirement. And twist one said, and by the way, this gets to the idea of dynamic withdrawal strategies. Remember, the 4% rule uh, just took out 4% in year one and then adjusted it for fl inflation every year going forward, regardless of what was going on in the market, regardless of your portfolio value, regardless of inflation. Uh, what this uh, professor did, he said, well, let's just kind of, kind of tinker with that a little bit. What if we do this? What if if stocks have gone up, you can see it right here, if stocks have gone up, the, the retirees will take their withdrawal from stocks and then rebalance the portfolio back to 90-10. However, if stocks have gone down that year, retirees will take their withdrawal from bonds and they won't, they won't rebalance, right? So that was sort of twist number one, T1. Twist two was similar, but rather than comparing stocks to the market, you know, did they go down or not? They actually, he actually compares the stock return to the bond return. And what he said here for T2 was, if the return of stocks is higher than the bonds, which you would expect to be the case most of the time, take your, your, your withdrawal, whatever that is, um, from, from, from stocks and then rebalance. However, if bonds have outperformed stocks, 
retirees will take the withdrawal from bonds and not rebalance the portfolio. Now, um, I don't want to suggest that these are the best or even good ways uh, to think about uh, retirement income strategies. These were two that he examined, interesting, I think. And um, here are the results. What he did was he said, okay, what's the failure rate? It's kind of fascinating to me. It didn't change, 2.3. Of course, the 60-40 is still zero. Um, but, but these are, you know, this is 2.3% out of 86 retirement scenarios that he looked at. So still, I mean, I would call that a success. Um, so, you know, the reality is if you're in retirement, you're going to be adjusting your withdrawals if things get really bad in the economy and with your market. I don't care what, you know, retirement spending strategy you follow. So uh, I think it's actually unlikely that someone's going to actually run out of money, but still useful information. But what, what I found also interesting is the mean and median uh, of these two actually outperforms the 90-10, which I found fascinating. Obviously, they all outperform the 60-40. We kind of already knew that. So um, uh, there you go. That's kind of an interesting take on the Warren Buffett portfolio as applied to retirees. Again, I'll leave a link um, in the um, uh, in the below the video so you can check out that uh, that study if it's of interest to you. Now, one last thing, uh, I will create the Warren Buffett portfolio in M1 Finance and leave a link to it below the video. You, you of course you can use it just by clicking a couple of buttons if you invested in M1 Finance or you want to invest in M1 Finance. But even if you don't, you, you can just check it out real quick. And uh, you can see the funds that, that I would, would recommend if you wanted to follow this approach. They're both Vanguard ETFs. And uh, I will, in a future video, actually walk through how to create what they call pies, basically a portfolio, in M1 Finance. I'm going to do that as part of reinvesting all of the credit card rewards uh, that we've accumulated over the last several uh, couple of years. Our, our balance now is up to about twenty dollars or $21,000. That's a, uh, an investment portfolio built entirely on the credit card rewards that we've received uh, over the last couple of years. It's kind of my way of showing, I don't know, maybe a, a, a clever or unique way uh, to save a little extra money, but also the power of compounding, how even relatively small amounts of money over time, invested wisely, can turn into you know big piles of cash. So I'll show you that in an upcoming video uh, shortly. But wanted to show you the Warren Buffett portfolio today. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.